With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree, look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome into the Situation Room. I am, of course, your host, Caleb Colquitt, and whether you're watching us on Facebook Live, on YouTube, on Twitch, Twitter, Periscope, however you're viewing us on the program this evening, we're certainly glad that you chose to make us a part of your day, which we always value and try to make good use of your time right here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. So welcome to the program, and as always, we try to do our best to bring you all of the biggest local and national news stories, and as always, local takes precedent. So we're going to talk about something going on in the state of Alabama. I am going to get to the big news of the day that everybody is talking about, the whistleblower report coming out, and we'll kind of go through that with a fine-tooth comb. But for now, we do have some local news, which, as always, does take priority right here on Tactics. So a couple things uh, with this particular story. It does revolve around our Attorney General, Steve Marshall, and he has actually joined 17 other states to defend scholarship programs to religious schools. So what's going on here is that there's a case that happened in the state of Montana, and the Montana Supreme Court decided on this case regarding a new Department of Revenue rule regarding whether or not state-funded taxpayer money could go to scholarship programs that were put together by the state if they were going to religious institutions. And so this was kind of their their takeaway from it, and there is a tie-in that kind of helps you understand why Steve Marshall, this might have caught his eye. But just coming at it from Montana's perspective, I'll explain how this all came about. This was a, a, a statement from the Department of Revenue in the state of Montana on the Supreme Court's decision. The Montana Supreme Court correctly concluded that the Montana Constitution prevents fu public funding of private religious schools. The state of Montana is ready to defend its case before the United States Supreme Court to protect Montana's Constitution. So a couple of things to point out here. In that particular statement, this is something that was decided by a state Supreme Court and it was a ruling directly regarding that state's constitution. Because of this, I have opted to not comment on that decision. I don't know whether that decision was correct or incorrect because I'm not familiar with Montana's state constitution, and I would imagine the vast majority of you listening to me right now probably aren't either. And that's okay. I don't know whether or not this specific one has anything, I don't know if it was decided correctly or incorrectly, essentially, because they're using a measure that I'm unfamiliar with. I'm familiar with Alabama's state constitution, although I don't know it as well as I should, because it's 900 freaking amendments long. <laughs> but nonetheless, as insane as, as the Alabama constitution is, um, I'm guessing Montana's is significantly shorter than ours, but still, I'm not familiar with their rules, so this could very well be a correct ruling. And because of that, I'm, I'm going to sort of take a step back and not talk about that decision. I'm going to talk about its broader principles and its broader implications when it comes to other states and precedent that it might set. So suffice it to say that uh, what's going on here is SCOTUS, has been under pressure to rehear this particular one because of the nature of it and because there is a uh, there is at least the understanding that there might be a First Amendment violation because there are those that are posing the idea that essentially Montana's state constitution, whether the decision was decided correctly or not, really doesn't matter because the question at hand that people are posing is, would this mean that this is a violation of the freedom of religion 
of the people in the state of Montana that want to use these state-funded programs to send their children to religiously based schools. And so that's going to be the angle that the Supreme Court, at least the Supreme Court of the United States, takes on this because as far as the Montana state uh, court's decision on it, I don't know if they would overturn that or not. And I'm not sure how they would decide that in the context of Montana's state constitution. But if the state constitution directly violates the First Amendment, even though I don't subscribe to this theory, there's a good chance that the Supreme Court invokes the Supremacy Clause and says that, well, the First Amendment says you have to have freedom of religion, therefore the state constitution can't supersede that. I doubt they would go that far to strike down something that's in the Montana Constitution, which, according to these people, it is. But it's an interesting question, nonetheless. And I'm not even somebody, and I'll talk to this in a second, that believes that the First Amendment directly applies to the states anyway, but that's been a long-standing precedent on the court, and there is going to be, even amongst the conservative justices, some that sort of lean in that direction. So that's kind of, of where we are. And uh, SCOTUS did announce back in June that it is going to hear this case. So I do find it a little odd that Steve Marshall, not bad, just odd, that he waited until now to join this amicus brief and essentially suggest that the Supreme Court should be hearing this case because they already said they were going to hear the case. Maybe the court can change its mind at this point. I don't know. And maybe that was his thinking, but it, it just seems that we're a little late to the party on that, and I'm not trying to be overly critical. I'm just saying that I, I'm not sure why there would have been this lengthy wait. But nonetheless, uh, here's the real question, in my opinion. Why does Alabama need to get involved? And I'm not saying there are no good reasons. I'm saying that should be the question at the center of everybody's mind. Why should the state of Alabama get involved in something that is going on in Montana's Supreme Court dealing with Montana's Constitution? Now, if the Supreme Court decided what it did on the grounds of the federal Constitution, okay, it makes a little more sense. Because what you don't want is other courts making decisions similar to that when based on the federal constitution, but we're not under Montana's state constitution. So why should the state of Alabama be getting involved? To my knowledge, there's not going to be any resources of the state of Alabama spent on this. I don't know that for sure, but it doesn't seem, based on anything that I've seen out of this case, that that is going to be what happens. But nonetheless, I do think that it is a fair question to ask why Alabama is getting involved in the first place. Luckily, Attorney General Steve Marshall did explain his rationale, and this is a quote directly from him. The decision violates the First Amendment by discriminating against parents who want to send their children to religious schools. And if the decision is not reversed, its reasoning could lead other courts to invalidate similar scholarship programs. That is why Alabama has joined this fight to protect our state's school choice program and the First Amendment rights of all Alabamians. So there's two parts to his rationale. The first is that the decision violates the First Amendment. The second is that if this decision is not reversed, other state courts and other federal courts may use similar rationale and use that as standing to decide cases later based upon precedent. I use standing incorrectly there. My legal friends will start commenting in the, in the section below. Precedent was the word I was looking for, not standing. So that that's really where Marshall is coming from. And my observation of that is I disagree with part one. And here's why. I do not believe that it is in any way a First Amendment violation to say to parents within that state that are citizens of that state, no, you're not allowed to use state funds for this school. I don't think it is. I don't think you are violating a person's religious practices by doing so. Now, if, you were, if the state were saying you're not allowed to send your kids to that school, okay, 100% on board with you there. But if you're just saying, no, we're not going to pay for it, 
I don't think that you can make a compelling case that that is a violation of the freedom of religion. Even if your religion did legitimately teach that you have to send your kids to religious school, and to my knowledge, there is not a religion on the planet that teaches that. But if that were an actual requirement of a religion, even if that were the case, saying, no, we're not going to pay for it, is a completely different ball of wax. The second part of Marshall's rationale I find far more compelling, because what you don't want is to establish precedent and have other courts deciding essentially the same thing based on Montana's decision. First of all, first and foremost, because other state courts are not going to be under Montana's constitution. And because of that, you would think that they wouldn't reach the same conclusion, but maybe they will, I'm not really sure. So here is the danger that other courts could follow suit. And this is, I think, one of the reasons that Marshall decided it was a good idea to go ahead and move forward on this. You may remember that Alabama actually faced a nearly identical case in 2013. Not exactly the same, but I'm going to point out the differences and the similarities. The Alabama Accountability Act set up a scholarship program, several scholarship programs actually, some of which went to religious schools. And there were similar people being similarly critical of this act at the time. So what was going on there is they were saying that you shouldn't be allowed to do this in the same way that people were saying you shouldn't be allowed to use taxpayer money to send kids to school on scholarships that are funded by state dollars. So that's what was going on in Montana. The difference in this one was instead of giving state taxpayer money to these kids for scholarship programs, the scholarship programs themselves were funded by private donations. Now, those private donations are, of course, private dollars, but they were getting a tax credit for those donations. So, not taxpayer money, but you're taking in less tax revenue as a result of people donating because they get a tax break based on how much they donated. So it's not nearly as direct as the Montana law. Here's the issue with that, though. If there are people that have a problem with that, and we're going to talk about the people that did have a problem with that here in a second, but if there are people that have a problem with giving tax breaks for charitable donations because that donation went to a religiously-based institution, well, then you've got a whole other slew of problems. Because if that's the case... We have to no longer give people tax breaks for donating to any religiously based organization. The American Red Cross, for example, or the Salvation Army. We've got to say, nope, can't take tax deductions off of those because you're donating to a religious organization. If that's the new standard, that's what we have to do to be consistent. And by the way, that would also include your own church. You wouldn't be able to write off your church donations whether it's a regular donation on Sunday that you give every week, something that you give or something that you tithe, or even if it's for a special event, like let's say you're giving to the food pantry or you have some clothes that you want to give away and your church has a, a clothes closet for, for people that are less fortunate, like uh, one of my old churches back in Auburn did. Or even if you're giving foreign aid or you're giving aid to a foreign country like we are in a few weeks with Ukraine here in Montgomery. Uh, sending an entire shipment uh, of medical supplies off to Nigeria like we did a couple weeks ago. You can see how very quickly this becomes a huge, huge problem. Because if those tax breaks are suddenly no longer going to be viable, then you're going to have to do that with every religious-based organization. And that's the problem that you're running into. And of course, there was somebody that had a problem with it. And it was the Alabama Education Association, the AEA. And what they were saying is that essentially the same thing that the people complaining in Montana were saying. That, no, you can't do this, and the reason you can't do it is because it violates some kind of separation between church and state. Now, the Alabama Supreme Court found that that was incorrect, overturned a Montgomery judge's decision and said, no, it's perfectly constitutional for us to give tax breaks to people who donate their own money to a charity, and that charity might go to religious organizations. And so 
I think that that's part of the reason that the Alabama Supreme Court was able to do that is because it wasn't nearly a one-to-one comparison. And also because again, you're judging the Alabama constitution versus the Montana constitution. I don't know what the differences are in that document. But even after all this, I'm still not 100% convinced that this is our business. I'm not saying that I can definitively say that it isn't, but I'm a little bit skeptical of Marshall's rationale here. I don't really understand why he decided this was something that we need to get involved with. Maybe there is an explanation, and I just don't see it, but... Attorney General Marshall, I like you, and I understand the sentiment underlying this, but I would need something a little more compelling because none of our courts are going to be judged based on the Montana Constitution. And so I I kind of see the danger, but I'm not thoroughly convinced that it's something that our state should be involving itself in. I don't think it's doing any harm, but I also don't want to spend any taxpayer money on this. I don't think that we're going to, but if we did, that would be where I'd draw the line because I think it being something that Alabama should involve itself in is frankly iffy. Now, let's talk about some larger principles because this is really where the rubber meets the road. Why is it that teachers' unions are opposing measures like this, specifically our teachers' union, the Alabama Education Association, Why is it that they had a problem with people getting tax breaks for donations of their own money that they were giving to organizations that may or may not be religious? It was specifically for private schools. And some of those scholarship programs were even done specifically for religious-based schools. There was one in North Alabama, for example, that was earmarked for Catholic kids that wanted to get out of the public school system and go into private Catholic schools. Why is it that the teachers union had a vested interest in saying, no, they shouldn't be allowed to do that? Because the teachers unions want a monopoly. They don't want competition. They don't like the fact that private institutions are coming in and taking kids from them. And so they want to make it as hard and expensive as humanly possible to get kids out of the public school system and into the private system. They don't really care that it's religious or not religious. They don't. They are just using that as an excuse to try to keep as many kids locked in to the public school system as humanly possible because they know that that's where their bread is buttered. That's really all it boils down to. So here's the second question. Is there a separation of church and state violation here? And the quick answer is no. I'll explain myself here in a second, but the quick answer here is no, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it wouldn't have applied to the states anyway. When the Bill of Rights was instituted and ratified, there were still four states that had actual state religions, and all four of them remained that way for a very long time. One, I believe, actually, it had an official state religion for almost a hundred years after the ratification of the Bill of Rights. And so the idea from the very beginning was always that the Bill of Rights are shackles on the federal government, not the state government. And this is something that held true for a very long time. And so there's that, first of all, since the education system is state-run and we're talking about state funding, I don't think that the First Amendment would apply there anyway. But, even if it did, there's a couple other reasons why I don't think it would be. First of all, every single one of the founders had a Christian-based organization, a Christian-based education, sorry. They had a Christian-based education. If you look back into the historic records, you can see that every single one of them had a similar curriculum. It was based off of an old Scottish method of teaching that was based off of two things, ancient Greek philosophy and the Bible. That's it. Now, it taught a lot of things that were not the Bible, and it taught a lot of things that were not ancient Greek philosophy, but that was the basis for everything. It started you out with the idea of how to do rational thinking, and I won't get off into all the details and all the specifics, but the point is, 
that was the origin of their education from the time that they entered education at a very young age all the way up until the time they graduated. Every institution that they went to was based off of the scripture. Noah Webster, for example, who his nickname was the schoolmaster to America. This was a very prominent founder. He founded schools and wrote school curriculums, all Bible-based. Several of the lessons were, I mean, they contained more Bible than, frankly, a lot of Bible classes that take place at churches nowadays. Far more Bible in them, sadly. Which is more a testament on how little Bible our churches teach now than I think it is a testament to how little Bible our, our public schools teach now. But anyway, so this was something that every single one of the founders would have had for themselves and advocated for. Something that Benjamin Franklin himself advocated for, saying that the Bible is the premier text that we should be teaching in schools. And then you also have Thomas Jefferson. Remember that he is the person that they credit with separation of church and state anyway. They're the ones that, he's always the one that they try to cite saying he's the one that came up with that phrase, which he didn't come up with that phrase. He learned that phrase, ironically enough, from the same education that was religiously based that they are claiming that should be the foundation for, <laughs> I know this is hilarious, but it, it was that, that same sort of Scottish uh, lineage of education, it, it came from the same idea, the same thinkers, and he meant it in the exact opposite way that they mean it today, which is that you should not have the government getting involved with the churches, not the other way around. But anyway, you also have to consider that Thomas Jefferson built a religious institution, the University of Virginia, and he founded it as a religious institution with state taxpayer dollars. So the idea that the founders would have objected to this, especially Jefferson, is patently absurd. He wasn't just giving money to religious institutions. He was using state dollars to build a state, uh, a religiously based state uh, university. And so uh, it, it blows a pretty big hole in the foundation of their argument. So this is the final thing. Should states be using taxpayer money to go to religious schools? First of all, I think actually no. And I know that that answer surprises some people. But I think that the better way to run the system is not to give people scholarships with taxpayer money, but instead offer an opt-out system. In other words, if you're not using the public school system, whether you're a single person or and, and don't have any kids, or you just want to take your kids that you do have out of the public education system, then you get to opt out. Any of the tax money that would normally go to state schools is withheld, and you get to keep that money and use that money towards your child's education. Now, I'm okay with legally requiring that you provide for your child's education in some way, I'm okay with there being a requirement that you either homeschool or you send them to some kind of school uh, that, you know, somewhere else, some kind of private school. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with having either a, a tax credit or a voucher program that proves that you are providing for their education. But the point is, you should be able to opt out. The idea that the government locks you in and forces you to pay for education that you may not even be using and that even if you do choose to go to a private school, that you're still having to pay double, you're still paying for the public school system, which you're not even using, is absurd. There is no reason that you should be doing that. And for me, a single guy who has no kids and has no intention of ever having kids, there's no reason for me to be paying into the system. Now, remember that public education put food on my table my entire life. My dad was a public school teacher. My mom was a substitute teacher for a while. My sister was a teacher for a while. I was a teacher for a, a very brief stint, but I mean, I, I did it. And so I don't hate public education. I don't hate public school teachers. This is in no way showing animosity towards the public school system. I'm just saying that you ought to have the option. If you don't like the public system, you shouldn't be paying for it. You shouldn't be obligated by law to pay for it. And that really, I think, is the better way to handle it. And then if you want to spend your own money, 
on a religious school or a secular private school, that's fine. That's up to you. I never have understood people that hate the idea that people might have more choice. But the bigger picture here, and I've noticed this trend just in my own experience, public schools by and large are going by the wayside. And the reason that they're going by the wayside is because they aren't delivering. They're not putting out a good product. And by that, I don't mean that the kids themselves are to blame. I'm saying the kids are not getting the proper education. And people are starting to realize that and pulling their kids out in droves. I don't know how many of my friends that have young kids that are saying, no, we, we can't do public school. I'll be honest, after my experiences in the public school, not that I have kids, but if I did, I don't think that I would put them in public school. My own father, a 27-year veteran of the trade, got teacher of the year in the state of Alabama before, is saying the same kind of thing, that if he had it all to do over again and had to deal with today's public school system, he's not sure that he would put them through that system because of the problems that have ensued. And when you have that kind of level of incompetence, that level of people just not being able to deliver on what they promised they would, it's no wonder people want out. And instead of trying to hogtie them, in kicking and screaming into a system that they don't like, the government should be assisting them. If they want to get out, they should be able to get out. And that's really the origin and the rationale behind the Alabama Accountability Act anyway. The truth is, the only way to save public education, and I want to save public education, I'm not trying to destroy it. If you want to save public education, there's only one way to do it. School choice. Make it easy for people to leave the public education system. And what is going to happen if you do that is that the public education system will have to compete for your business just like a private school would. And that will make public schools better. Because when they have to actually show you results, as opposed to you just being hogtied and having, uh, having them hold over your head, well, you can go to the private school system, but it's going to be super expensive. And by the way, you still have to pay us whether you're using the service or not. Once that incentive is gone, let's see how popular public schools are. They won't be nearly as popular anymore. And when that happens, they will have to get better or go by the wayside, which is the way that it should be. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. And now for a reading from the Social Justice Warrior Bible with Pastor Gregory Post. Welcome in. I'm Gregory Post, head pastor at the Eternal Living Word Transdenominational Community Church and Coffee House in Nevada, California. And now it's time once again for another reading of the SJW Bible. Today's story is going to be about how Naaman was cured of his leprosy in 2 Kings chapter 5 verses 8 through 14. And it says, It happened when Elisha, the man and or woman of God, depending on how he identified at the time, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. And he sent word to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horse and his chariots, which were sustainably raised and emitted no greenhouse gases, and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. Not that I am implying that you were dirty just because you were a leper. That would be leper-shaming. But Naaman was furious and went away, saying, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand all over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Paphra and the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him, saying, Wow, that Elisha guy is such a xenophobic jerk. Where does he get off implying that the rivers in Israel are better than the rivers in our country? That nationalist jerk probably believes in Israeli exceptionalism too. So then God spoke to Naaman directly and said, Naaman, I am so sorry for being intolerant and not accommodating enough. I should never have asked you to have to go and do something to be cured. 
you believe in me, and since purification comes from faith only, I'll just go ahead and heal you right here and now. And from that hour forward, his flesh was cured, and they all went out to try some local craft beer. Wow, so inspirational. Thank you for listening to this reading of the SJW Bible. And remember, the only truth that matters is your truth. And welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us on Tactics. And, of course, we are going to get to the big, big news story of the day. You may remember yesterday we read the transcript and uh, just sort of went through some of the big details in the transcript script that was released. Now we have the original, the, the original, the original whistleblower complaint. So once I'm able to talk again, we'll go ahead and go through this. Um, now, first of all, be before I get into actually reading it, I want to give props to the Babylon Bee because they are really doing the Lord's work down there. Uh, they really hit the nail on the head with this headline. Uh, this is from the Babylon Bee. Um, if we can get that graphic pulled up. There we go. So this is the Babylon Bee. A uh, transcript revealed that Ukrainian president argued for 15 minutes about who <laughs> would hang up first. I mean, I know it's satire, but the truth is, if this is what the transcript really is, if that's what it had really revealed, would you have been surprised? Because I'm going to be honest, I wouldn't have. But let's go ahead and look over this report. So this is the report from the, the whistleblower that originally brought this to everybody's attention. Dear Chairman Burr and Chairman Schiff, I am reporting an urgent concern in accordance with the procedures outlined in 50 USC 3033K5A. Uh, this letter is unclassified when separated from the attachment. In the course of my official duties, I have received information from multiple U.S. government officials that the President of the United States is using the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 U.S. election. This interference includes, among other things, pressuring a foreign country to investigate one of the president's main domestic political rivals. The president's uh, personal lawyer, Mr. Rudolph Giuliani, is a central figure in this effort. Attorney General Barr appears to be involved as well. And then he goes on to list a few concerns. I was not a direct witness to most of the events described. However, I found in my colleagues' accounts of these events to be credible because in all cases multiple officials recounted fact patterns and were consistent with, with one another. In addition, a variety of information consistent with these private accounts has been reported publicly. So there's a couple big problems with that. First of all, he is openly admitting, and I appreciate at least his honesty in this, that he was not a witness to the events described. So in other words, he has no first-hand information. It all came from other people. But he's saying that because he believes that these accounts line up and, and have been sort of confirmed by multiple different people over and over again that these testimonies are true. Here's the problem with that, though. Why haven't they come forward? And if there were a full investigation then inevitably that is what would happen, is that we would talk to these people, get the lowdown, figure out exactly what happened. But up till then, it is exactly as I described it yesterday. This is basically a workplace rumor. Like, who threw up at the office Christmas party? I mean, as far as reliability, that's about the amount that this sort of comes to. I'm not saying that it's completely incredible. I'm not saying it never happened. I'm just saying that as of yet, that's all we have. And that is not a good reason to move forward with impeachment of a president on that alone. So keep that in mind. A little further down in this whistleblower testimony. The 25th July presidential phone call. By the way, this is the same phone call that was being referenced by Donald Trump. This is the same call that we got the transcript of yesterday. Early in the morning, 25th of July, President, uh, the president spoke by telephone with the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Vil, uh, Zelensky. I do not know which side initiated the call. 
This was the first publicly acknowledged call between the two leaders since a brief congratulatory call after Mr. Zelensky won the presidency on the 21st of April. This part we know to be true because we have the records of it. Multiple White House officials with direct knowledge of the call informed me that, after an initial exchange of pleasantries, again, something we saw on the call, the president used the remainder of the call to advance his personal interest. Namely, he sought to pressure the Ukrainian leader to take actions to help the president's 2020 re-election bid. According to the White House officials who had direct knowledge of the call, pres the president pressured Mr. Zelensky to enter Alia. And this is the things that he's alleging that the president did. First, initiate or continue an investigation into the activities of former Vice President Joseph Biden and his son Hunter Biden. Okay, well, this is one that we actually do know to be true because he, he did say that um, continue, not initiate, because this was something that seems to have already happened or at least happened and then got nixed and, and President Trump's trying to bring it back from the grave. So we do know that, that he at least mentioned Hunter Biden's name and he suggested that it would be a favor to him to look into that. The second one. Assist in purportedly uncovering the allegations of the Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election originated in Ukraine with a specific request that the Ukrainian leader locate and turn over servers used by Democratic National Committee and examined by the United States cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike, which initially reported that Russian hackers had penetrated the DNC's networks in 2016. I thought that's what the Democrats wanted. Seriously, because if you're talking about Russian election interference, isn't it the Democrats that have primarily, not exclusively, but primarily been the ones beating the drum saying, hey, Russia did hack the election. They were trying to get in they, and succeeded in getting into our servers. They were trying to manipulate it. We want to get to the bottom of this. And now all of a sudden they have a problem with Donald Trump saying to the Ukrainian president, by the way, there's this thing going on, CrowdStrike, where it seems as though there were people in the Ukraine that were working for Russia that tried to hack into their servers. Could you find out about that for me? If President Trump's motivation is strictly political, why would he want them to get to the bottom of this? It seems to me that, if anything, that would help the DNC, not him. I don't really see how it could help the DNC, quite frankly. But the point is, it certainly wouldn't help him politically. So if your pre-assumption is that Donald Trump's only doing this for his own political gain, I fail to see exactly what this part of it would be helping him with. Now, I do think that it's a very serious thing that Russia tried to involve itself in our election, and specifically that they were hacking the DNC servers. My question is, why wouldn't the Democrats want to get to the bottom of that? Seems like they should be the ones that are most interested in figuring out how that went down, if, if it had anything to do with Ukraine. And then the last one. Meet or speak with two people the president named explicitly as his personal envoys on these matters. Mr. Giuliani and Attorney General Barr, to whom the president re referred to multiple times in tandem. Now, here's the important part of this. It is true that Attorney General Barr and Giuliani were involved in this. However, we know from the transcript that we read yesterday, it was not President Trump that brought up Giuliani. It was President Zelensky. Which pokes a pretty big hole in this argument that Rudy Giuliani only got involved at the behest of the president. It was the president of Ukraine that was actually asking for Rudy Giuliani's help and asked specifically to have him sent over there. President Trump did that at the behest of President Zelensky, not of his own accord. Now, the Attorney General being involved, that's not really a surprise that Trump would go to him first. And why would Trump go to him first? Why would he be the first one to suggest that Barr get involved? Because he's the Attorney General. He's the guy in charge of investigating shady things. That's his job. He and the Inspector General, that's pretty much all they're charged with doing. And so it absolutely makes sense that Barr would be involved. It would be weird if he wasn't. So it's 
it's trying to make something sound nefarious, which with the transcript, we know it wasn't nefarious with Giuliani. In fact, it was the Ukrainian president that wanted that. And when it comes to Barr, well, obviously Barr's going to be involved if there's something shady going on. He's the guy in charge of the investigations. That would be like, isn't it real suspicious that they wanted the sheriff to investigate a crime? Well, well, no, the guy's the sheriff. That's his job. I don't see where you're having some problems here. All right, a little bit later in this same document, Donald Trump expressed his conviction to the new Ukrainian government that it will be able to quickly improve Ukraine's image and uh, complete the investigation of corrupt cases that have held back cooperation with Ukraine and the United States. We know this to not be true. We know it's not true, because we read the transcript. We read it yesterday. There was absolutely no insinuation whatsoever that there was a quid pro quo. At no time did Donald Trump say that he was going to withhold something or give something to the president in Ukraine for doing this. Basically, he said, look, we're looking into it whether you do or not. It would be a big favor to me if you could help out on your end and sort of expedite this thing. And that's not an unreasonable thing to ask. $1.8 billion of taxpayer money just vanished in an oligarch's bank account, and we can't figure out why. For the left, who seems to talk about how evil billionaires are, and tries to claim that Donald Trump himself is an oligarch, you think that they would be interested in $1.8 billion of our money just going missing, especially to the guy who, was, who owned the bank and owned the natural gas company that was being consulted by a completely untrained, completely unexperienced Hunter Biden. And that his firm got nearly uh, millions and millions of dollars, I don't remember the exact amount now, Millions and millions of dollars in consulting fees despite having no experience in the natural gas sector or the energy sector of any kind. You would think that Democrats who claim to be champions of getting rid of corporate corruption would be a little more curious about that. All right, let's continue on. Uh, the next part of this. Uh, there we go. This is the second part of this complaint. Efforts to restrict access to records related to the call. In the days following the phone call, I learned from multiple U.S. officials that senior White House staff officials and interviewed, uh, intervened to lock down all records of the phone call, especially the official word-for-word -word transcript of the call that was produced, as is customary by the White House Situation Room. This set of actions underscored to me that the White House officials understood the gravity of what had transpired in the call. The White House officials told me that they were directed by the White House lawyers to remove the electronic transcript from the computer system in which transcripts are typically stored for coordination, finalization, and distribution to ca cabinet level officials. Instead of the transcript, instead, the transcript was loaded into a separate electronic system that is otherwise used to store and handle classified information of especially sensitive nature. One White House official described this act as an abuse of the electronic system because the call did not contain anything remotely sensitive from a national security perspective. This is a legitimate concern. Why was the president using a system that is normally reserved only for classified, uh, classified information? Why would he put something that didn't contain anything classified in that separate electronic system. What would his motivation have been? Well, the assumption given in this complaint is that there was something in there he didn't want the public to know. I think what's going on, and I could be wrong, I think the reason was he didn't want the Democrats to catch wind that there may be some retribution coming for them and their involvement in the Ukraine. This is a guy, Donald Trump has talked about it many, many times. He doesn't trust the intelligence, uh, in, he doesn't trust the intelligence people. He doesn't trust the people that are, you know, right up there in Washington. I don't think that he has a problem with some of the street level FBI agents, that kind of thing. But he doesn't trust the intelligence community as a whole. And he distrusts Congress, and he has so many leaks, 
which by the way would include this guy that wrote this, whoever he may be, that he's constantly worried about information getting out and being taken the wrong way. So it seems to me that if I were President Trump, I might do this too out of an abundance of caution. Does that make it right? I would say no. It does appear as though in this matter, now I don't think it, any, it even comes close to reaching the level of an impeachable offense, especially when we now have the content of that call and we know that there was nothing nefarious discussed in it. I don't think the president was trying to cover his trail because he did something wrong or illegal. It seems to me he was trying to cover his trail because he was afraid that word of that would get leaked out and the media and the Democrats would react exactly the way that they're reacting now. That seems to be the more logical conclusion to me. And if you're a guy that is as paranoid as Trump is about this stuff, and frankly he has a right to be, that is not an unfounded paranoia considering what has been done to him over the past few years, and the leaks that he's experienced from within his own White House, you can see why there would be an abundance of caution. Still doesn't make it okay to break the rules, but at least you understand why he thought that that would be an acceptable way to handle this. Uh, that, to me, is the only part of this entire letter that may contain something that legitimately gets the president in trouble. Trouble. Not necessarily huge legal trouble and nothing that even comes close to an impeachment. But something that I can understand, okay, yeah, that was a dumb thing to do. But it's still, even though it's a violation of the rules, we know that at the very least there was nothing nefarious contained within the letter or the transcript of the call itself. And so getting overly bent out of shape uh, is not necessarily something that I think that we should we should be too overly zealous about. Um, I still think that there should be some repercussions. That's the way that I'll leave it. So this is the next part of this. I also learned from multiple U.S. officials that on or about the 2nd of August, Mr. Giuliani reported, uh, reportedly traveled to Madrid to meet one of President Zelensky's advisors, and, uh, Andri Andrie Yinmark, the U.S. official characterized this meeting, which was not reported publicly at the time, as, quote, direct follow-up to the president's call with Mr. Zelensky about the, quote, cases they had discussed. Separately, multiple U.S. officials told me that Mr. Giuliani had reported privately, uh, reportedly privately reached out to a variety of other Zelensky advisors, including Chief of Staff Andriev bon, uh, Bondan, and acting chairman of Sec the Security Service of Ukraine, Ivan uh, Bankanov. And I know I'm butchering those names. I'm doing the best that I can here. <laughs> Again, this was all something that was requested. If you remember in the transcript that we read yesterday, the president of Ukraine said, yes, Mr. President, we like your model. We think that there's a lot that we can learn from you. And it would really help us if you could send Mr. Giuliani over here to advise us on some of those things. We'd really like to have him involved. And the president agreed. So the fact that, as this states, this was a reaction to the phone call, well, yeah. But what you're forgetting is it wasn't President Trump that sent Giuliani over as his agent. The president of the Ukraine wanted him to be there. He's the one that came up with that idea. And the second half of this is that uh, when you're looking at the, the fact that he was meeting with all these different officials. What did you expect for Giuliani to do when he was over there? Again, that's what the president wanted. That's what he asked for. President Zelensky was the one that came up with this idea in the first place. And so there's no reason to believe that anything nefarious was going on because of that. So here's the, the next part of this a little bit further down. The, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, specifically the U.S. Ambassador Marie Jan, uh, Yanovich, who had criticized Mr. Litsino's organization for its poor record on fighting corruption. Well, yeah, Ukraine's one of the most notorious corrupt governments in the world, so that's not an unfounded uh, conclusion to reach there. And I say that as somebody that's been to Ukraine, that's talked to some of the people there, they know it's corrupt. 
this is something that's very common knowledge. It, it's been a running it's been a running joke, actually, on the world stage how corrupt Ukraine's government has been in the past few years because of the shadow organizations that were set up in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Union. Anyway, so that's one thing that was brought up. They, they had allegedly obstructed Ukrainian law enforcement agencies' pursuit of corruption cases, including by providing a do-not-prosecute list and had blocked Ukrainian prosecutors from traveling to the United States expressly to prevent them from delivering their evidence about the 2016 election. Well, yeah, because they said that. This isn't something that we pulled out of our butt. This is something that is very well documented. Peter Schweitzer included it in his book, Secret Empires. Those officials said that they were going over there to try to fight the corruption, and all of a sudden their visas got pulled. So the insinuation of corruption is backed up by actual evidence. So I, I don't understand what the problem is here. And this is the last part of this claim. Former, President, uh, former Vice President Biden had pressured former Ukrainian President Petro uh, Pro, Proloshinov, whoever the former uh, president of Ukraine was, I can't pronounce the guy's name, in 2006, to fire Ukrainian prosecutor General Viktor Shinokin in order to quash the purported criminal probe into Burisma Holdings, a Ukrainian energy company on whose board former Vice President's son, Hunter, sat. Yeah, here's the thing. That's not just an allegation by the president, as you're sort of suggesting in this document. And here's why. We actually have video evidence of Joe Biden himself admitting to this. Clip one. Let's go. Um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a b <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid. So that is Vice President Biden in a public venue, aware of the fact that cameras are on him and everything, bragging about getting the prosecutor fired. In this document, if you were to read it, what they're saying is, oh, well, the president and his cronies, they were over there in Ukraine and they were suggesting that Vice President Biden, that he would be over there and he tried to get this prosecutor fired. Well, yeah, Biden admitted to it. Bragging about it at a public venue. That's not a allegation. That's not even reasonable suspicion. That's a flat-out confession. Well, yeah, they would have talked about that. Because Biden talked about it. I don't see why they're so up in arms about that being alleged. Biden admitted to it. It's just, after watching that and looking at this and trying to essentially insinuate that the president was doing something nefarious by even talking to president, which he didn't, we, you saw that he only mentioned Biden's name once and didn't go into any detail, that even mentioning that he may want to look into that, that that is somehow underhanded and nefarious, when Biden himself admitted to it on camera, it's just so patently absurd. So let's move a little bit further down. On about the 29th of April, I learned from U.S. officials with direct knowledge of the situation that Ambassador uh, Yanovoyevich Yonav had been suddenly recalled to Washington by senior State Department officials for consultations and would most likely be removed from her position. Around the same time, I also learned from a U.S. official that associates of Mr. Giuliani were trying to make contact with the incoming Zelensky team. 
On the 6th of May, the State Department announced that Ambassador Yonvanovich uh, would be ending her assignment in Kiev as planned. However, several U.S. officials told me that, in fact, her tour was curtailed because of pressure steaming from Mr. Lutzino's allegations. Mr. Giuliani subsequently stated in an interview with a Ukrainian journalist published on the 14th of May that Ambassador Yovonovich was, quote, removed because she was a part of the efforts against the president. Well, duh. I don't see why this is a problem. If you have an employee that you believe is directly trying to undermine you, why wouldn't you remove them? I don't see why this is something that should be frowned upon. If I'm an employer and I'm managing people and I got one guy that I'm convinced is trying to undermine me at every turn, of course I fire that person. Why wouldn't I? It's the same case that they tried to make with the uh, Secretary of State, Sally Yates, that was the interim Secretary of State until President Trump's nomination went through. They were saying, well, she got fired for refusing to do what the president did, uh, said, told her to do. Doesn't everybody get fired if they refuse to do what their boss tells them to do? Is that, like, not a thing? It just it blows my mind the kind of things that they try to attribute some kind of nefarious undercurrent to President Trump. There are parts of this report that I can look at and say, yeah, I can see where they're having a problem with that. The main thing that I mentioned just a few minutes ago was that Trump was improperly documenting things classified that weren't actually classified because he was afraid that the Democrats would catch wind of it or that the media would make a big deal out of it. That I understand being a little skeptical about and wanting to look into it further. I'm okay with that. But suggesting that President Trump shouldn't have fired an ambassador that he believed was directly trying to undermine him? I don't see... No sane person would keep an employee on if they were doing that. And what amazes me about this is a lot of this stuff, it refers back to the transcript, but as we saw yesterday, the transcript does not insinuate anything nefarious. Some of these things were mentioned, but at no point was there a quid pro quo, so I don't see what the big deal is. And then, here's the final part of this. During the same time frame, multiple U.S. officials told me that Ukrainian leadership was led to believe that a meeting or phone call between the President Zelensky would depend on whether Zelensky showed a willingness to play ball on the issues and that that had been publicly aired to Mr. Letzino and Mr. Giuliani. Note, this was a general understanding of the state of affairs as conveyed to me by the U.S. officials from late May to early July. Uh, to early July. I do not know who delivered this message to the Ukrainian leadership or when. See enclosure for additional information. If this is true, if this is true, that is a big problem. Because if the president is withholding aid or withholding something in exchange for the Ukrainian president doing what he wants, in other words, manipulating another foreign leader to help him out, okay, I see why that is a problem. I see why that is a pretty big area of concern. But where's the proof? This is sort of included at the end of the document because there is no proof of this, and he admits that there is no proof of this, that it was basically hearsay going around in the office. Now, maybe that's viable, maybe it's not, but at this point, if you put this evidence in front of a judge and you were trying to prosecute Donald Trump, the judge would say, get out of my courtroom. There's just not enough there. There's not enough to even suspect something was done incorrectly. And that's really the issue that you're running into. At least as far as the there being some kind of arrangement or agreement that, hey, you give me dirt on Biden and, and I'll get you, get you your four and eight. Okay, I mean, if that happened, yes, that's a legitimate area of concern. But right now there's no evidence that that actually did happen other than a water cooler rumor that's going around. So let's look at this next little part. On the 13th of June, the president told ABC's George Stephanopoulos er, that he would accept damaging information on his political rivals from foreign governments. Well, yeah, who wouldn't? 
And if that's something that is to be frowned upon, then why is it that you keep upholding the still dossier, which was the origin, according to McCabe, who was one of the top brass at the FBI at the time, saying that there would be no Trump investigation without the still dossier, why is it that you admitted that as the basis of an actual investigation that took two years and cost us $35 million when that was oppo research given to Hillary Clinton by a British intelligence officer and paid for and put together by the Russians. If that's your problem, and I don't understand why it is, but if that is your problem, then you have to apply the same standard to the Democrats. You can't just say it's wrong for one side to do it and not wrong for the other side to do it. I don't have a problem with either side doing it. I have a problem with that being used as the basis of an investigation. But as far as Hillary Clinton paying for opposition research from another country, technically that's not breaking any laws. And so let's just try to maintain the same standard either way. Now, here's another part of it that I did find interesting, and this is actually after the official part. This is uh, part of the uh, formerly classified portion of the uh, of the addendum that, that was added into this. On the 18th of July, an Office of Management and Budget official informed departments and agencies that the president, quote, earlier that month, had issued instructions to suspend all U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. Neither OMB nor the NSC staff knew why this instruction had been issued. During interagency meetings on the 23rd of July and the 26th of July, OMB officials again stated explicitly that the instruction to suspend that assistance had come directly from the president, but they were still unaware that a policy of a policy rationale. As of early August, I heard from the U.S. the U.S. officials that some Ukrainian officials were aware that the U.S. aid might be in jeopardy, but I do not know how or when they learned of it. This is smoke. And granted, smoke can mean that there is fire somewhere, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee it. Not in this sense. It definitely warrant it definitely warrants further investigation. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I'm okay with getting more information on this part. Because if the president was actually withholding foreign aid in exchange for something from the president of the Ukraine, okay, that is a real problem. But right now, all we have is that it was cut off at some point and they're not sure why. Well, if you're not sure why, that's not enough to move forward. If we find out why and it was politically motivated, all right, let's look into it. Because then there really should be some repercussions on the president. But here's what this all boils down to. A lot of the information that we've looked at, we know for a fact is wrong because we've seen the transcript. We know what actually happened in the call. And because of that, everything in this should be taken with a grain of salt because we know at least parts of it were unreliable. We know that parts of it turned out to be absolutely nothing. And because of that, I'm not saying you throw the whole thing out and ignore it. I'm just saying that you have to remember that this guy's information has been proven to be unreliable, at least in some areas. And he's admitting he does not have firsthand knowledge of these events. And so if his sources were wrong once, there's no reason to believe that those same sources might be wrong more than once. Actually, they were wrong several times, if you'll look through what we just read. But nonetheless, it's not a 100% ironclad source. And because of that, we should be taking this with a pretty hefty dose of salt. I'm not saying don't look into it. I'm just saying let's keep that in mind. But ultimately, the issue here is, for all of this to be a problem, you have to believe one thing. That President Trump was only looking into this because he thought it might help him in 2020. And maybe he did, I don't know. But that's going to be something that's very difficult to prove. And part of the reason for that is, it seems as though, including the video clip that we just showed you of, of President, or sorry, Vice President Biden admitting to having done this, that it looks as though there's a lot more evidence to go uh, to to put Biden in the wrong than there is with Trump. And so you could assume that Trump is only doing this for political purposes, but you could also assume 
that he's doing it because he's the president of the United States and it falls upon him to look into matters like this. That's his job. For example, to go back to my sheriff analogy, if there is a sheriff that has reasonable suspicion that somebody that is running against him in the next election for sheriff, if he has reasonable suspicion to believe that that guy is committing a crime and he starts looking into it, it's not necessary, it's not necessarily the case that he's only doing so to help his election. Now, maybe he is, and if it turns out that he is, then he's a corrupt politician and we need to do something about that. If he's planning evidence or making something up, but if he has reasonable suspicion, even if the other guy he's investigating just happens to be the guy that is running against him, he still has the right to do it. It is still his job to enforce the law. And it is still President Trump's job to enforce the law. Because you can guarantee, if the roles were reversed, if it were President Trump who had had Donald Jr. or one of his other children that were vastly enriched by this deal, and he was getting rid of the prosecutor that was looking into how that all shook out and how it happened, you can guarantee that the Democrats would be losing their freaking minds trying to get to the bottom of this. But when it happens to Joe Biden, all of a sudden their curiosity just goes out the window. And the only thing that they can focus on is the guy that's trying to go after Joe Biden. Now, maybe he is just doing it for political reasons. I don't know. But even if he is, that's going to be very, very hard to prove. And whether he is or not, it is still his job to go after people that he has reason to believe have committed a crime. And so, I hope that we get to the bottom of this at some point. But as far as the president having done anything wrong, I don't see any evidence of that, at least not yet. We have speculation, we have conjecture, but right now we do not have evidence. If that comes out, then we'll have to see where that goes. All right, we'll go to a quick break and we'll be back in just a moment. Hey, where are you going? Champ, Slugger? Hey, cowboy. Where are you going? Where are you going? I'm going out! All right, here we are. So you guys remember last year... One of the things I talked about in a segment called Straw Wars is how the liberals, despite no scientific evidence or backing whatsoever, believe that somehow they are saving the sea life by banning plastic straws. In response to this, Mellow Mushroom has started giving out paper straws as opposed to plastic straws. So what we're going to do is we're going to see how effective the paper straws are with the most difficult drink to drink a milkshake. Let's see how this stands up. Alright, so first of all, I got about two sips out of that and the paper stuck to my lips. This thing does not work too well. Boy, it'd take you two hours to drink this. <laughs> well, see, I'm using plastic. That's John from Millbrook, by the way. He's I don't care. Driving. I think they use plastic because that's the best thing to use. This thing sucks. Well, actually, it doesn't suck. If it sucked, I'd be fine with it, but it doesn't. milkshake will melt before I finish this. <laughs> All right. Experiment over. It's biodegradable. All right. We're going to fix this now. There we go. Good old petroleum-based plastic straws. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, that's so much better. I got a question about this. Oh, oh yeah? With the paper, aren't they concerned about the trees having to cut down the trees to make the straws, too? Is that not a... Well, that's one of the points that I made. It doesn't matter what you make the straw out of. You're expending some kind of resource. Well, yeah, because we all live here. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, it doesn't matter what you make any product out of. You're expending some kind of resource. Mm -hmm. And, th and that's true of straws or anything else. 
Well, I tell you this, just based on this little experiment, I know that I saw that Disney is planning to go completely paper straw by 2020 on all their cruise lines and all of their amusement parks. I contend that Disney World is not the happiest place on earth if I can't drink a dead blame milkshake while I'm there. But I will, to their defense, say one thing. Oh? You can take a pocket knife in. So help me. That's something. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So even though this went about the way I expected it to, paper straw experiment failed miserably. I imagine if I had left it in there much longer, it would have dissolved. I had a buddy the other day that uh, went to the a place that used paper straws. He said he had to hoard six different straws throughout the course of his meal because they kept dissolving on him. <laughs> Which I'm sitting there thinking... You can't tell me that using one plastic straw is worse for the environment than six paper straws. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just common sense. Anyway, all right, thanks guys. I'm gonna enjoy the rest of my milkshake. Now you messed it up. <laughs> You're stupid. <laughs> And today's Daily Dose of Stupid is brought to us by Representative Sheila Jackson. Sheila Jackson tries to talk to us about guns, and we'll go through it. And, and as usual, when politicians, especially Democrats, try to talk about guns, they wind up showing more of their ignorance than their knowledge about them. So we'll go ahead and look at this clip from Sheila Jackson. I've held an AR-15 in my hand. I wish I had it. It is as heavy as 10 boxes that you might be moving. Uh, and the bullet that is utilized, a 50 caliber, these kinds of bullets, uh, need to be licensed and do not need to be on the streets. 90% of the people want background checks. Over 60% want a ban on assault weapons. 80% plus want red flag laws. And um, I would venture to say those numbers would be similar for storage laws and for licensing laws regarding uh, the question of firearms and ammunition. And finally, interestingly enough, Americans support the buyback program, which all of us could have in our respective communities. So that's Sheila Jackson. And uh, <laughs> uh, you can't make this stuff up. They just uh, constantly, it's a gift that they give conservatives where they constantly talk about guns and show over and over again, how very, very little they know about the subject to which they are discussing. So here's the thing. If Sheila Jackson's AR-15 that she allegedly held, if that thing was as heavy as 10 boxes, like 10 moving boxes, then either that thing had a really, really big dumbbell tied to the end of it, or Sheila Jackson is super out of shape. <laughs> and and 10, 8 to 10 pounds feels like 10 boxes that you would move. I guess that's the only explanation that I can come up with because she's, she's clearly not in great shape, but it shouldn't feel like moving 10 boxes when you pick up an AR-15. It's one of the lighter guns that you actually can carry. It, it's no heavier than my shotgun. In fact, my shotgun might be a little heavier than it is. So to put in perspective how incredibly wrong Sheila Jackson is, I have this picture here. This is Cheyenne Roberts. She's a 10-year-old girl holding an AR-15. By the way, excellent trigger discipline there, Cheyenne. Uh, excellent form. She is a competitive shooter, and you can tell by the way that she's, she's holding it, this isn't something that's all that heavy. She's a 10-year-old little girl. So either she is the strongest 10 little girl in human history or she's able to very comfortably hold 10 moving boxes. Uh, you can, I'll leave it up to you to decide what that is. And uh, she also postulated that the AR-15 fires 50 caliber rounds. It does not. And to show you how far off she was, this is Sheila Jackson with her AR-15. By the way, probably knows a lot more about firearms than I do. She custom built this particular AR-15. So, uh, you know, props to her on that. This is a M10 sniper rifle to compare. This actually does fire 50 caliber rounds. And remember, Sheila's a 10-year-old girl 
the soldiers that you're seeing in the picture with the M10 rifle, they're full grown military men. <laughs> so uh, they, they look pretty different just looking at the pictures, but they're even, it's an even larger difference when you remember how much bigger the guy holding the M10 is. So clearly there is a size difference there with a firearm that, that fires a 22 caliber like an AR-15 and fires a 50 cal like the M10 sniper rifle. And this just, again, highlights how very, very little Democrats know about guns, Sheila Jackson in particular, thinking that the, <laughs> that the AR-15 fires 50, round, uh, 50 caliber rounds. To my knowledge... Every AR-15 fires a 223, so about about a, a 22 caliber round. And most hunting rifles, to put that into perspective, use 30. And when you consider that, and by the way, this isn't just my opinion or something that I'm throwing out there. According to American Hunter, which is a, a magazine and a publication that that does things on hunting. They had a list of their top 11 most popular hunting rounds. Of these, nine were larger than the 223 ammo that AR-15s use, and not a single one was smaller. Not one. Every single hunting round that they recommended was either the same size or larger than the rounds that are used by the AR-15. I know that the Second Amendment is about hunting. That's not the point that I'm trying to make here. I understand it's about self-defense. It's about the defense from a tyrannical government specifically. But I'm saying even if it were about hunting, and they're saying, well, you should only be able to use hunting rounds, yet yeah, the hunting rounds are bigger than what the AR-15 fires. Now, they're not 50 caliber like that sniper rifle that we just saw, but they are significantly larger than the 223 ammo that the AR-15 uses. In fact, some shooters refer to the 223 as a varmint round because it's not as big as what you would use to take down an elk, any kind of big game, even white-tailed deer, because this 11 top 11 rounds that I'm using here, it was specifically for white-tailed deer hunting. And all the ammo that they recommend out of the 11, nine of them are larger than the 223. So even if it were about hunting, you're way off, Sheila Jackson. You're not even in the same realm as correct. And what's hilarious about all this is she was saying all this to establish authority. In other words, what she's trying to convey to the people listening, oh, see, I'm, I'm not somebody that doesn't know about guns. I know about guns. I've held an AR-15. I know that there's no reason that people should be able to hold a, uh, to be able to own a gun that heavy, which is a little confusing because why would banning a gun because it's heavy have anything to do with it? Even if the AR-15 really were super heavy and hard to carry, why would that be a reason to outlaw it? That doesn't make any sense. Now, at least the next part of what she's saying, that, well, it fires a 50 caliber round, well, that would make it very destructive. That would make it a very powerful gun. I don't think that that's necessarily a reason to outlaw it. But the point is, at least I can understand from that perspective, what you're saying is it's a very destructive heavy round, but the thing is they don't use that. They don't use anything close to that. The, the caliber uh, round that a AR-15 uses isn't even half the size of a 50 caliber round. And so it just continues to show her ignorant, uh, ignorance on this, even though she was saying it specifically to try to establish that she was not a buffoon when it comes to guns, she proved herself to actually be a buffoon when it comes to guns. And when it comes to her stats about public support, let's look at those. They're all based on vague terms or incomplete information. For example, she said 90% of people want background checks. Yeah, well, we have those. We have background checks. We have for a very long time. This was established back in the 70s. And, I mean, with the, with the Gun Control Act, th this is something that has been going on since long before I was even born, long before I was even conceived. My parents were young when the background checks were implemented. We've had those for a really long time. Uh, when it says the uh, people support the ban of assault weapons, what's an assault weapon? Can you define that? Because if you're talking about the assault weapons ban of the 90s, whether people supported it or not, 
statistics have shown over and over again it didn't do any good. It didn't actually bring down crime. It didn't actually stop mass shootings. In fact, mass shootings were more common in the 90s when the assault weapons ban was in place than they are now. Schools are safer now, less likely to have mass shootings or mass casualties from said shootings. And assault weapons, according to that definition, well, those were actually used in some of the mass shootings in the 90s. So apparently it didn't keep people from getting their hands on them. When it comes to a red flag law, depends on what you mean by red flag law. There are some red, red flag laws that I would support. Generally speaking, when you're talking about the state implemented red flag laws, most of those I don't. But conceivably, you could come up with a red flag law that I'd at least consider. There was one that was proposed in Alabama that I wound up ultimately being against. But the point is, I thought that it, it at least came from a place of reason. There were at least a few compelling arguments to implement that one. But what do you mean by red flag laws? Because if we're talking about that kind of red flag law, okay, I can see where you're coming from. If you're talking about most of them, I would say, no, there, that's not even a starter for me. So what do you mean by red flag law? That can mean a lot of different things. What do you mean by buyback? Because most people, when you talk about buyback programs, they think about the ones we have here in America, where a bunch of government officials use government money to buy back firearms from people, which I agree is dumb and it's unproductive and it doesn't do anything to curb crime. But at the very least, it's not taking advantage of anybody's rights. It's not forcing anybody to have their guns taken away. But now you've got several Democrat candidates, three of them, in fact, talking about mandatory buybacks. In other words, what Australia did, where they're saying, no, you have to turn in your guns or you're in violation of the law. So what does buyback mean? If you're talking about the other kind of buyback, I think they're dumb, but I don't think that they're a violation of the Second Amendment. The other one clearly is. And so, again, you're, all of these things that she's saying are based off of these vague terms or people with incomplete information. If you make a term vague enough, you can make it seem as though people support pretty much anything. And let's look at this last claim. I love this. I would venture to say those numbers are similar for storage laws and licensing firearms and ammo. Well, venture to say means, oh, I don't know. I would guess. That's another way of saying that. Maybe she's right. I don't know, but she doesn't know either. So why bring it up? To the, the people that I've talked to, even people on the left that I've talked to about storage laws, they're not on board with those. And they're also not on board with licensing firearms or having a national gun registry. I have friends that are on the left, some that are even claimed to be socialists, that still say, no, we shouldn't have a national gun registry. That defeats the purpose of the Second Amendment. And that really brings me to my final point on this. Yes, Sheila Jackson is a moron. And yes, everything she said in that short little 45-second clip was completely wrong. Or at the very least, maybe it was right, but it was incredibly misleading. The stuff about what the, the actual functionality of the, the firearm she was talking about was completely wrong, wasn't even close to right. But even if everything she said in that clip was true, even if every word was the truth. None of it matters because we have a Second Amendment. Even if AR-15s really were super heavy, so the Second Amendment doesn't say the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, well, except if the gun's like super heavy and stuff. It's not how the Second Amendment reads. It doesn't say, well, except for 50 caliber rounds. AR-15s don't fire that, but even if they did, it's still not a reason to ban it. It's still not a reason to outlaw it. The Second Amendment also doesn't read, well, if there's a lot of people that don't like the fact that people are owning certain guns, then you should be able to infringe on it. It doesn't say that. When it all comes down to it, Sheila Jackson may not know anything about guns, but whether she does or not, she's ignoring the Second Amendment and the God-given right to self-preservation and the ability to defend yourself. So, yeah, she's dead wrong. But the truth is, even if she were right, it still wouldn't make any of those arguments make sense. Because from a constitutional perspective and from a human rights perspective, we still have a right to keep and bear arms. End of story. That's why there's no wiggle room in the Second Amendment. That's exactly the way the founders 
wanted it. Let's go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. And for today's chaplain's report, I have to talk about something that I've been going through myself because I think it's important and I also think that, or I hope at least, that some of you will be able to take something from this and benefit from it. Because the truth is, I've been struggling with the sin myself here recently. And I have learned something from my back and forth of the sin. It's not the first time I've struggled with it. Uh, Lord knows that, that this is something that a lot of men struggle with, but it, it's something that I've had a real problem with here recently. I've been struggling with the sin of lust, and I I know that I shouldn't. I know that I'm past the age where this should be something that should be a real thorn in my side, but just to be honest with you, it's something that I do find a great deal of difficulty in. But for a while, I had been doing a lot better. I'd gotten to the point where I didn't think about it hardly at all. But recently, I, I kind of had a relapse, and I noticed that that relapse coincided with something else in my life. And that was when I got really busy with these two new jobs, doing the radio thing and, and also working at Faulkner. I got so busy that I started neglecting my daily Bible study and my daily prayer time. And I noticed that the less time that I had to focus on those things, the more likely I was to fall into this particular sin. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. I'm not saying it was the only factor, but I think it was a major factor. And I was reminded of a verse in 1 Peter 5, 8-9, through 9, that really kind of drove this point home where Peter says, Be of a sober spirit, be on alert. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. There's a lot of application to this very practical wisdom, but I'm going to touch on at least one tonight. Why do you think it is that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing people he didn't exist? It's because if you don't believe the devil is real, you have no reason to be on your guard for him. I mean, I don't spend my time wrapping myself in crosses and garlic because I think that vampires are going to show up at my doorstep, because I don't believe they exist. I say, you know, reason to defend myself from them, because they are not real. The devil is a different animal. He convinced people that he wasn't real, and that made his job so much easier. Because if you're not a person that has a biblical worldview and goes through this life not believing that you are engaged constantly in a spiritual battle, you're a lot more likely to be killed when you're not on your guard in the field. It's a lot more likely that you will fall in battle if that is the case. And that's why I think it is so dangerous. And the reason that this verse talks about vigilance being the key. You'll see some of the older, the older translations use vigilance. I think that this translation is fine. Be of a sober spirit and be alert. In other words, we have to prepare for this. We have to be on our guard, alert, aware, sober, knowing what's going on around us, having some kind of spiritual situational awareness to our surroundings. And when we neglect to read our Bibles, when we neglect to pray, when we neglect to have fellowship with fellow Christians, that guard starts to drop. Because we're no longer preparing ourselves for the task at hand. 
to use an, an analogy here, and I know that we're in the midst of football season right now, a lot of football games are decided before either team makes it to the stadium through preparation. You see, the team that knows their opponent the best, the team that is aware of what their opponent is likely to do or unlikely to do, and train and condition themselves to be ready for that contest, is often the one that winds up victorious. Now, maybe a team doesn't have to do much preparation. Maybe it's one of these teams where it's a, a really powerful Power 5 conference team ag against a little community college, and they don't have to prepare all that much, and they can rely on natural ability. But that's not very often the case. And sometimes, even then, one of the smaller schools can look up and wind up beating you if you're not adequately prepared. It's the same thing when a fighter goes into a ring. A lot of times that fighter, the one who's better prepared, who knows his opponent better, and who has prepared in advance through strength and conditioning and training, the one who is most ready for the fight usually winds up winning. Not every time, but most of the time. And I think that the spiritual fight, the spiritual welfare that we're engaged in here is the same way. To use the Bible's analogy, if you were in a forest and you knew that there was a hungry lion wandering around looking to devour you, wouldn't you get ready? Wouldn't you make some kind of mental and physical preparation to combat him? I mean, you lay a trap or you dig a hole that you can hide something. You do something to make sure that you're not at a disadvantage with this lion. And what's important to note about a lion versus a human? A lion is far more likely to triumph. He has every advantage. He's stronger, faster, more powerful, has claws and teeth, which humans don't. And so in that sense, we are made fully aware of the fact that the devil is better prepared than us. He has more natural ability than us. Remember, he has been doing this for a really long time. He knows how to entice humans. He's been doing it since the fall of man. We understand this. We know that he's out there and that he's a lot smarter than us and a lot more experienced than us. And so if we fail to prepare, we're going to lose most of it. If we wait up until the time that we are actually tempted to start thinking about temptation, we're probably going to lose. We're probably going to fall into whatever temptation it is that is being dangled in front of us at the moment. And so what we have to do is plan ahead of time, know what we're going to do, know how we're going to react, and be able to be on the lookout to avoid temptation when we can and be ready for it when we can't. When we have to go through a time of temptation, we're aware of it and we know what we're up against. And we're still not going to succeed every time. But the point is we stand a lot better chance against that lion if we've given it some forethought, some preparation. We have made ourselves ready for that contest. And I want you to look at the bottom part of this. I want you to look at the, the part of it that happens in verse 9. There is also strength in numbers. Where it talks about at the tail end of verse 9 there, it says, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Do you really want to stand up against a lion by yourself? I don't. When you face that temptation, when you face the devil head on, don't you want to have somebody there with you? Even if they're not there with you in the moment, they at the very least were there to help you prepare the trap to prepare yourself for that event. That you've got some help going on there. And of course the Lord is there to help you. And of course he is the one that ultimately allows us to be victorious. But the point is, Paul is, or sorry, Peter is pointing out here that your brethren are a big part of that. And notice how he phrases that. He says the experiences are being shared. In other words, don't just rely on your brethren because there is strength in numbers, even though there is. Also rely on them because there's a good chance that other Christians have experienced this. There's a good chance that your brethren have gone through exactly what you're going through. Lean on them. Trust them. And have them give you advice in how they've overcome things, and that'll help you in the future. Because brothers and sisters, if we're not prepared and we're standing alone, we're there 
without our preparation, without God and without our brothers, I'm just going to be honest with you, we don't stand much chance. Not against a lion. And so if we remember that the devil is a lot stronger, a lot smarter, and a lot more experienced than us, hopefully that will motivate us to remember to mentally and physically prepare ourselves to put on the whole armor of God and to make ready for that contest. And that a great way to help us prepare is by staying in communion and in communication with our brothers and sisters that know what that fight is like. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.